Tonight, I want to welcome Warren Simons uh, to our webcast. Uh, I recently uh, saw uh, his uh, presentation on uh, Linda Nichols' uh, weekly program, uh, Linda's Happy Hour, or I think it's Linda's Getting Happy Hour or Happiness yeah. Hour. Yeah, my <laughs> happiness hour. Happiness hour. I was really impressed with the program. Uh, uh, it's got a lot, you know, he's just got a lot to offer. Uh, Warren's originally from the Northeast, uh, Massachusetts, then he lived briefly in New York City for 25 years. And now he's uh, down in Alabama in, um, in uh, Hunts no. Montgomery. Montgomery. And I, I think Huntsville, because I watch all these space shows and they're always talking about the space center and stuff. But um, anyway, it, his photographic uh, mantra, I believe, is the world is full of visual surprises hiding in plain sight. So he's always looking for photographic subjects and he goes into it without, you know, a predetermined idea of what he wants to find and just looks and, and, and finds amazing things. Um, this is, really speaks to me because that's kind of like what I like to do is to, you know, find what the scene will give me rather than, you know, well, if, it, if I don't see a blue sky and a red flower, I'm going home. So, um, but anyway, after seeing his work and, and listening to his talk, I'm reminded of some of the iconic photographers like uh, uh, Jane Mizell and Freeman Patterson, who also, you know, are able to find unique uh, pictures in what seem to be rather mundane settings. So uh, anyway, I, I think that uh, there'll be a lot of cool stuff for us to see and get inspired with. Uh, I, Warren has uh, stated that uh, he's, he's happy to answer questions uh, during the program. So if, a, if you have a question, dump it in the chat box and I'll keep track of that. And I'll pass the questions on to Warren. Uh, with, so uh, with that as an introduction, Warren, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Can everybody see my desktop? Yes. Great, great. Um, I want to thank you. Hmm. Okay. That was somebody from the ether talking to us. Um, I want to thank you for asking me to uh, come and speak with you tonight. Um, I think the most important part of photography for me is in the seeing. Um, I have a great little camera. Uh, this is what I use. It's a Sony RX100. Uh, this is version seven. It has um, a lot of the bells and whistles that digital SLRs have. It has a great um, Zeiss lens on it. Um, it's a, a wonderful camera, um, but it doesn't take the pictures I do. And I think that um, one has to master the art of seeing in order to be able to express vivid work. And so that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, how I practice the art of seeing and how, and importantly, how I got to where I am today, because it's been a journey of almost 20 years that started out without me even thinking I ever had a single artistic bone in my body. And it has taken me somewheres that I I couldn't even possibly guess at when I first started. Um, and it's been very exciting. So anyway, so we're, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, so um, as I said, I've been expressing the visual world with my camera since uh, 2003. I don't have any um, formal education in art or in photography. It's all, everything that I know has all come through either self-study or working at it. Um, and it all starts with what is my uh, state of mind? Um, I consciously try and slow down and relax. Um, when I'm out and about, I try and turn off the internal dialogue in my head. I try and, you know, the, the critic, uh, this is good, that's bad, I can't believe you just did that. Uh, I'm never going to be able to find anything interesting. I also try and turn off the external ex uh, distractions. I turn off my phone. I generally don't go out with other people because I find that that's a distraction. It pulls me out of actually looking. Um, and I work to just see what's in front of me. And that might sound a little counterintuitive. That is to stop thinking in order to see the world more clearly. But um, 
it's a tried and true method for me. It really, really works and I've come to trust it completely. Uh, Jerry Uselman is a really wonderful photographer. He does all these really cool photo collages. It would be worth uh, taking a look at his work. It's ethereal and surreal and um, spiritual and all kinds of different things. Anyways, I read a review recently with him and he said, well, I could go out of my house and walk around the block in less than five minutes. But if I go out of the house with my camera and walk around the block, it's going to take me two hours. And that's the kind of seeing that I'm interested in. Um, I don't consider myself a photographer, um, at least not in the normal sense of the word. I think um, of myself more as being a student of seeing who uses the camera to express that work. But if someone really presses me for a description of what I do with the camera, I tell them that I'm a contemporary, uh, sorry, contemplative photographer. That is that I'm working to slow down um, and really look at the world around me. Um, and I'm not looking for specific subject matter. I don't rule anything in or anything out um, based on a preconceived idea of what is good or bad subject matter. I'm just trying to see without expectation or forethought of what might happen. I'm not trying to impose my vision on the world. I found that if I can relax and um, try and give up all hope of um, succeeding and all feel of, of fear of failure um, and just look that it's in those moments that for me the visual poetry and magic happens. Um, I think to as I practice with this it's it's those it's in those moments that the visual revelations occur. I'm not trying to replicate something I'm trying to let the world reveal something and hope that I'm paying attention. Um, when it does, um, and to develop a sensitivity to perceive and appreciate those things in the everyday world that keep happening. Um, and if I stop my presentation right now, and that was it, I've essentially given you the essence of how I work. Um, that is, be still, be quiet, pay attention, let things unfold in their own way, let the world gobsmack you. Um, but there's a whole lot of, to the backstory, and so I want to get into that a little bit. Um, and seeing for me doesn't have to have an, uh, happen in a dedicated time frame. like I'm going to go out on Saturday for two hours. Sometimes it's when I'm putting the groceries away like it was here with these tomatoes. Or I'm at work and my coworker puts his cigarette and lighter down on the table next to a couple of clamps that we're working on and I'm just struck by that still life. Or I'm visiting a friend at their house and I walk into the kitchen and there's a glass on the table and the blinds are open and the reflection is playing on the glass table and I'm just, you know, astounded by it. Or I'm, I'm, I'm on my way home from work and I'm walking along the normal path that I take every day and I just happen to turn and look left and I see that chair. It's a March, cold March gray day and um, I'm really gobsmacked by the melancholy of it all, the sadness. Or I'm making breakfast in the morning and uh, the light's coming through the window and it's playing with my glass of orange juice and with the dish drainer and the light and the shadow that's all going on there. Uh, this just keeps happening again and again and again. And um, it's, it, I, I just adore it. I love it. This is my task um, after lunch is to wash the dishes and I've thrown ice out of our glasses into the sink. And all of a sudden I look and I, I'm like, wow. And I run for my camera. I know where it is. Um, so I don't have to think about that. Um, another important part that comes to play besides slowing down is uh, in, in seeing is serendipity. Uh, you might think that serendipity is blind luck, but it really isn't. It's actually something that you can practice and you can make it happen. And it flows out of being curious and exploring. So for instance, in this photo, I'm out, I decide to go out and do just a little exploring. I'm running, I have an idea of where I'm going, but I've never been down here before. I get to where I'm, I'm um, out in the countryside. I turn right and head down a country road and a car go whizzing, goes whizzing past me and kicks up a whole bunch of dust. And then this is the scene that's in front of me and I stop the car, step out and, and take this image. Or I go next door, I take care of my uh, neighbor's house when they're away. And in the mornings I open the blinds and in the evenings I shut them. And on this morning, as I stepped in and turned left, I saw the blind uh, playing in the sunlight through the window and that shadow and the shapes. Um, it was really kind of an astounding moment for me. Uh, the golden rule for me is I never, ever, ever leave the house without my camera. 
it fits into this wonderful little case. And it, because it's small enough, it fits over my belt loop. And on this morning, even though I was just going next door, a camera was with me as it always is. And I was ready to express this um, moment when it happened. Um, I practice every day. Musicians practice all the time. Athletes are constantly working on what they do. Poets try and write every day. And I think as photographers, we have to practice uh, seeing every day. Uh, it doesn't always have to be something that involves the camera. Recently, I was doing some um, investigative work uh, on the uh, Anderson Scott, who is a Montgomery photographer who passed away a couple of years. He just had an exhibit at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts here in Montgomery. And in the course of doing some of that um, research, I found that he went to Yale and that his uh, teacher there was a photographer and a master printer and someone who was the head of the art department there, Richard Benson. And it got me kind of interested. I decided to go and find out who Benson was. There was a video of him. And he said something that just gave me a little nugget of wisdom that I sort of have in my pocket and think about from time to time. He said, if he could render the world with clarity, um, no, he said, if um, that the world was way more interesting than his mind, anything that he could dream up, and if he could render the world with clarity, that is what he saw, then there was content content in it that would um, illuminate him. Um, I read some a book by John Berger, who is an art critic, and he was discussing Edgar Degas' uh, sculpture work, and at some point in the course of Degas' work on it, Berger says. I think Degas started to obey the commands of the model and not the will of the artist. Another little nugget of paying attention to what's there as opposed to trying to impose your version or vision of something. And I really love um, poetry and I've come to love Billy Collins's poetry. Um, and he says that as a poet, it's their poets, it's their vocation to keep an eye on things. Uh, to see what escapes most other people's attention. And I hope that the work that I do can um, alert people to the possibilities that are in the visual world. This little uh, image here, I was in the gas station getting my car service and I decided I wasn't gonna sit around and fiddle, twiddle my thumbs. So I went out behind the gas station and went down the alley and a little further down there was a window and on the inside there was some plastic and it was bubbling up. This is another one of those wonderful moments where you just go looking and exploring and serendipity happens and something really cool uh, appears in the visual world. Or I'm crossing the street from a neighbor's house and another neighbor, um, Inga, who has a giant magnolia tree in her front yard, she rakes them up every day. She's a master gardener. She keeps her yard uh, pristine. And there was a bag of these leaves and they were cooking in the sunlight. And it just created this um, wonderful semi-abstract moment that I happened to see. And because I was paying attention and had my camera and could express it. Or I'm standing on a street corner and this moment of, I can't believe what I'm looking at. This car pulls up, I turn and look and there's this dog hanging his head out the window with his uh, band rays on, sun rays or whatever they're called. Um, so I'm able to ca capture it because I've got my camera in my hand and I'm actively looking. Um, that's, um, that's what I practice. It isn't how I always came about uh, this work. And what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about how I got here. I mean, it wasn't a linear process. For the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna sort of com compartmentalize um, what I talked to you about, um, but you should know that it's been a wonderful mashup. Sometimes things happen separately in the course of what I'm experiencing or studying or reading about. Other times they're going on at the same moment um, and occasionally they're intertwined. The process of are intertwined of learning and changing and developing, um, but it's really been fabulous. But this woman, was sort of the um, the big bang of my universe on this question. Her name is uh, uh, Betty uh, Edwards. She was an art teacher in California and she was struggling to teach her um, beginning art students how to draw. And she stumbled across a method for doing that was that was very successful. Um, it became the basis for her dissertation for her doctorate degree. And coming out of that, she wrote this book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And this book is taught in many um, art curriculums. It's, some, it's one of the, the early basic books that um, art students read as they start into an, an art program. Um, and it's a really fabulous book. 
um, there's a lot about this book that uh, science has since it was written in the early 70s when they were um, and they just started coming up with CAT scan machines that could visualize the brain. Science since then has um, clarified that it's a more complex process than just the right side of your brain, which is the art side and the left side, which is a lo logical rational side, um, uh, learning how to use one side uh, for um, artwork. It's more complicated than that, but there was something um, really um, important in the course of this, and I'm gonna show you what it was. In chapter four, in the version that I have, this image is printed on the page just as you see it upside down. Um, by the way, I came to be reading this book because I wanted to learn how to draw. This was in 1996. I remember it clearly. A good friend of mine was an artist and she said, well, read this book. This is a really good place to start. So I did. I got to chapter four. Edward says, don't try and tell what it is that you're looking at. Don't draw any associations to it. Really just pay attention to the lines, the angles, the shapes, the forms, how they relate to those things around them, how they relate to the frame. And I want you to take a pen and a piece of paper or a pencil and a piece of paper and for the next hour or two, very quietly and carefully pay attention to what you're looking at and draw it. You can erase, um, but just do that. And while you're doing it, paying attention, pay attention to what your state of mind is. Well, I draw like a third grader, or at least I did. And I decided, well, okay, I'll do it. I'm skeptical though. And when I was done and I rotated the book and my work right side up, this is what I had. On the left is the Picasso contour drawing of Stravinsky and on the right is mine. And I was really, really gobsmacked. Um, I couldn't believe that I'd actually drawn that. It was really a stunning moment for me. And it was a, the light bulb went off and I realized that there was another way you could see, you could visually see, you could come to visually see and learn how to represent that or express it, in this case, with a drawing. And that involves forgetting the name of something. When you look at something like this, it's easier to forget what it is, the objects that you're looking at, the associations that go with it. Because when you can do that, when you look at something and you under, you know what it is, you immediately, your brain makes the association and then starts cramming in all that other data that's in there based on your life experience. And you stop seeing clearly what's in front of you and more likely are seeing the associations in your brain. It's a very subtle thing. But when you look at it this way, you can forget the names. It can help you calm down and you can just look at what's in front of you. Um, and let the visual world connect in some way with your sensibilities. Um, and so for me, this exercise was the first conscious practice that I ever did of trying to find my way into the zone or the flow state, the things that uh, painters often talk about. And I found that if I can manage to do that, that and get my brain in that kind of a place, that that's where my best and deepest seeing happens. And I want to just show you these folks, the drawing of the right uh, on the right side of the brain people um, do workshops around the country. On the left is the image on day one and on the right is the image on day five of a series of people who took their workshops. This is out of their book. And it's really stunning the transformation in a very, very short period of time in somebody's ability to draw. It's really not a transformation in their ability to draw. It's a transformation in their ability to see. Um, and it was all a stunning, stunning um, thing for me. Well, I got involved in some other projects outside of drawing. I drew for a couple of years and then I dropped it. I was busy with something else, took up all my free time. But in 2003, we were going to go to a, a Hawaii on vacation and I bought my first digital camera. And when I got home, I decided I was going to take it with me every day to work. I bought one of those little things that would slide onto my belt. I was using a Pentax at the time. And on the first day to, uh, on my way to work, I took this picture. It was a puddle. And you'll note the way we're looking at puddles and reflections, it's upside down, very much like the drawing um, in the book from Edwards. And when I got home, I flipped it right side up and I was learning how to use Photoshop and I um, deepened the saturation and the color of the leaves and adjusted some of the um, light and dark values. And it created something that was very painterly and I was totally, totally taken with it. 
And when I get taken with something, I tend to get really passionate. Some people would say I'm obsessed, but um, it's a passion. And so for the next three or four months, I did nothing. It was through the fall and winter and early spring. I did nothing but look for puddles or wet surfaces in order to take the reflections that were in them. So it might have been a steel plate in the road or uh, the pond, one of the ponds up in Central Park or something I saw on 34th Street when I was walking across town and saw a reflection of the Empire State Building. Um, all of this happening during the period of time when I was in New York. Um, I went out to visit my brother in Seattle and was just roaming in the neighborhood around his house and somebody had this really cool pool with these fish in it. And there was a reflection of the side of the house in the pool and it was just very a very surreal moment. It took me a second to figure out what it was I was looking at. And I went through Union Square on my way to work and there was a, a drainage um, pipe that um, plugged up and for months and months every time it rained um, I could sit there on my way home and take pictures in that puddle um, and one day I came through after a heavy rain really excited about what I was going to be able to do and the Roto-Rooter guy was literally there his truck he was pumping out that pipe and that was the end of my puddles so there's only so much rain in New York it's not Seattle or someplace like that um, I was posting my work on a website and I saw someone else doing some work where they were taking pictures of still lifes and underneath the still life setup, there was this shiny um, reflective material. And so I wrote to that person and said, what is it? And he said, it's Mylar paper. So I went looking, I found an art store in the city that sold two different versions of the Mylar paper and long rolls. And I developed this little method for taking two-sided thin plastic carpet tape and lying strips on a 15 inch by 20 inch piece of half inch piece of foam board. This is what you're looking at here. And then pulling that tape and adhering almost like a dry mount that paper to the board. Um, in this case, Janice, my wife is demonstrating uh, the board. It isn't how we did it. I didn't go out with her. I would go out, the board would be in my left hand. Actually, here it is. <laughs> The board would be in my left hand, my camera in the right. I would tip the board down. I would get a reflection in the board. Again, keeping in mind that this is a reflection, so it's upside down. And I'm continuing the exercise from the Edwards drawing of the right side of the brain book and what I was doing with the puddles. And I could take a picture. And I did that for five years. I mean, I literally took no other straight pictures. I just walked around with this board. I took it with me everywhere. This was the first image I ever took of it. This is what it looked like when I took the image. This was the Jean-Claude Cristo exhibit in Central Park, the Gates exhibit. Um, when I got home, I rotated it up. This is what I, um, I ended up with. I, I just love this image for its demonstration purposes. When you look at things like this upside down, you really see the graphic design here, that vortex pulling you in. Whereas here, it's not quite as apparent, although it's there. It's one of the foundations of um, the visual um, thing that happens when you uh, look at this image. So I started doing this nonstop for five years. This was something I saw in my kitchen one morning at six o'clock. I, I just gotten out of bed to get a glass of water. I ran for the board. I knew where my camera was. I took the picture. It's uh, my kitchen counter. That's a, a fire extinguisher on the um, the counter, it's the fan in the window and the tree outside. The fruit vendors and taxis are ubiquitous in New York. And um, this was one of those moments when I was walking home from work and saw this person and took the picture. This is um, something I saw in a floral shop when I was on vacation in San Francisco. Uh, it's interesting to try and get that board through the TSA security. Um, they are always wondering what the heck it is. Uh, roaming around in New York City and Washington Heights in the upper end of Manhattan. This was the shaved ice guy who roams around. Something I saw from the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, the thing that I really adored about this is that it looks really painterly. And because I'm a frustrated painter, I, uh, I really loved it. And at some point, while I was posting this work to that site I mentioned, somebody said, well, this is very pictorial. And I didn't know who the pictorialists were. So I went and started digging and I found out who they were an early, a late 19th century, early 20th century school of photography that would take negatives and play with them in some way. Maybe they would shoot two or three negatives and develop in the darkroom using those three, one on top of the other or some sort of special thing they would do in the development process or 
um, shoot multiple images with the same frame, um, all of it geared to create something that was more than just a replication of what was there in front of them. I found out that um, Edward Stieglitz was a major comp a proponent of this kind of work. And he was also a big part of making photography a fine art he, um, here in the US and around the world. Um, you know, photography was still new to the scene and there were still lots of fights about whether it was really art or not, or a craft. Um, he eventually rejected pictorialism. So I'm working like this. I find the pictorialist, I could jo go join a camera club, the pictorialist uh, club of uh, um, New York City. Um, I'm thinking about stuff, I'm reading, I find Stieglitz, I find West and I find other photographers. Um, all the while I continue to work using this method. Um, although I'm starting to think that maybe Stieglitz had something um, important to say about um, how to proceed. Well, so anyways, the city's full of people whether they're reading on a park bench or skating at the rink up in Central Park, or I find a rose in November, which is really weird because everything is dead by then, but this one wasn't. And it was something about the way the, plight, the light played with the paper uh, that created this very three-dimensional feel. This was like the size of a softball. Something I see under the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm on vacation out on Long Island in the fall, and I see something in the woods. I love the colors of fall. I'm in Gloucester, Massachusetts, visiting friends, and I'm upstairs in the bedroom, and the guy next door is painting his house, and so I shoot a, an image through the window. Um, so I spent five years doing that. While I was doing that, and after Stieglitz said, yo, there's another way to do this, I started looking. Um, I found Michael Freeman's book, The Photographer's Eye, Composition and Design, uh, which is fabulous. That's a must read. Um, Bruce Barnbaum on the Art of Photography, another really good book. Both of those books spend a lot of time talking about design, composition, framing, how, the, how all the pictorial elements that are out there in the visual world come to play with how a, an, an image looks and how we respond to it as viewers. And I also found Freeman Patterson, who's a Canadian photographer who uh, loves to play and explore, really explore. Um, and he talks a lot about the art of seeing. He's written three or four books on this subject. Anyways, I, I started reading through them. And one of the things I realized was that there were real strong graphic elements um, in the visual world. And I want to just show you a subset of images that I think that I've taken that I, that, uh, I think show in a very graphic way that this was um, an escalator at the Seattle airport when we were flying through there one day. We got off the 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 train that takes you out to Terminal S or A or whatever it was. And my wife and I were both stunned when we looked up and saw this. Um, that wasn't hard to say, take a picture of me. Something I saw from a balcony of a friend's house. Um, something I've seen here in downtown Montgomery, a very strong formal formalism where the, the subject matter and what it is, is less important than the graphic elements that are contained within that. Something I saw when I was in Yosemite Park at the top of, a, um, I think it's Gaylor Mountain. This is Gaylor Lake. Looking down from the top of the hill, uh, the ice was just um, moving out and the lake was covered with a, a fine scum of pollen. And I couldn't believe my uh, good fortune to see it. Uh, reflective squares and rectangles and color and line uh, in something I saw in a building in New York City something on a uh, stairwell in a parking garage, more squares and graphic elements. So the visual world is full of this, full of it. And it's really important as photographers to get really good at what we're doing is to study that stuff um, and really incorporate it into your marrow and then forget about it completely. Just let it be there. And instead, just go roaming and see what happens. Let the design elements that are everywhere move us in some way, um, in a way that doesn't involve engaging our intellect, but grabs us in some sort of visceral way based on uh, the, the design elements. Okay, so that's a little subset and something that occurred while I was on this little journey. Another one was reading this book by Alexander Horowitz. She's a be animal behaviorist at Columbia University. She wrote a book on how dogs see. She had a dog 
they would walk in their neighborhood. She paid attention. She wrote a book. She thought, well, that was, a and it was very popular. And she said, well, that's cool. Maybe I'll do something with humans. So she organized a bunch of walks in her neighborhood with all kinds of different people. A bug doc, a guy who knew everything about bugs and could talk to her about what he saw in their walk. A typographer who could tell her everything about the signage a metallurgist person who could tell her everything about the buildings and the sidewalks and the material, a doctor who could talk about the people, on and on and on, a horticulturalist. And she'd walk blocks in her neighborhood and then she created this book based on a chapter dedicated to each one of those people. And she said, what was really cool was that each one of them um, exhibited what psychologists call selective enhancement. That is, they, they've come to know a part of the world, in this case, a part of the visual world, based on their experiences. Um, and they get to show us that little sliver of the world. Um, a great book, but the very best part of that book was the walks that she took with her 18-month-old son. This is me in 1956 with my cousin Annette and I'm about 18 months old. And I think, I don't remember this, but I think that's, I'm holding a camera case. <laughs> and maybe I was, you know, foreordained that this was gonna happen. But she said the best walks that she took was with her son who was 18 months. She said, man, we couldn't get down to the corner. It took us an hour to do that. He was fascinated with the manhole cover and the texture. He wanted to look at the gum stuck to the sidewalk. He was fascinated with the way the bars ran down the, um, the sidewalk that came out of the building, the fire trucks that roared by, the people that walked by. She said, he, kids that age are the, the best and the truest visual explorers in, in the world because everything is new to them. It's like they landed here from Mars. They have no concept about what any of this is and they're fascinated by all of it. And what I took away from reading this book was that's what we need to do. We have to find our way to see the world like that again. And if we can, if we can find ways to do that, then those moments that are there in the everyday world will get clearer for us because we won't, we won't, you know, think about it. You go on vacation, you go somewhere new and everything is new and you're like totally excited. And a week later, you've been there for a week and you stop seeing stuff you know, the experience changes. And that's part of what goes on in our heads and what it means to be a human and how you, you, you survive. You can't possibly see everything new and fresh all the time, but you can certainly work at it. So that was another really wonderful, fabulous book. And here's some images that for me, show me that, yeah, I've sort of gotten this idea about selective enhancement. This is a piece of paper lying in a puddle. I didn't do anything to this. I just came along and saw it. And, and I've since then, I've started looking at every puddle and all the gutters that I walk by. Because um, in this case, it was a, a human form that I saw. I was walking on a beach in Gloucester and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And this continues to happen. And so I think I have, I, I'm not sure why, I have this weird selective enhancement ability for seeing the human figure in all kinds of weird and unusual places. Or I've learned to stick my face in every trash can that I can see, any open trash can. In this case, it was in my neighborhood. I was out walking just after it stopped raining. And I went over, this is the first time I went over and I said, I'm just gonna see what's in there. And this is what I saw, the rain droplets, the pull of the way the bag was pulling and that little piece of trash at the bottom of the bag. And I couldn't believe it. Well, I look in trash cans every day now when I go by. And I've come to know that cars have a really fabulous reflective surface. The windshields, the hoods, the doors, the side view mirrors, something I saw when we were on vacation in Florida. Um, I never, something I saw one day when I was walking outside right after it finished raining and I saw a leaf on the windshield of my truck. Um, I never ever get bored when I go to the store. If I'm walking in to do grocery shopping, I make sure to look at every car as I walk along. And if my wife is going in the shop, I say, take your time. <laughs> you can take as long as you want. I'm not gonna have any problem keeping myself occupied. And occasionally someone will come by and it's their car that I'm looking at and they'll say, what the hell are you doing? So I'll show them, I'll show them the camera, the photo in the camera and we'll talk a little bit. And almost always they walk away with a little grin on their face. And I think they're like, wow, either that guy's really weird or there's something really cool going on here. Um, windows, peering in windows and looking at reflections in windows. 
There was a mannequin in this window and the reflection from the street playing in the window on a gray day that just, I couldn't believe it. Um, and in this case, I was actually looking into the store that had been closed. There was nothing in there. And there was just something about um, the low level light and the way that that frosted glass in the back um, appeared, the way the light was playing through the window and the images beyond that. Um, this was one of those moments where um, this was a very emotive image for me. I had a very strong sense of melancholy in this image. And so I, uh, I took it, I expressed it. There's all kinds of um, other non-photographic art things that we can read and study. On the left, actually, that is a photo book. Uh, Brooks Jensen is the editor of Lenswork Magazine and Lenswork Publishing. Every month he produces a, um, a magazine and he writes a little editorial piece at the beginning of it on some aspect of photography and the creative life. I'm telling you, this book and two others that he's produced in this way are fabulous, just filled with little nougats. You can see the little stripes of sticky paper that I put in that book that I constantly go back to and reread because I just think they're just such fabulous little nuggets of um, ideas that are important to think about. Um, Art and Fear, um, it's a book geared towards artists, but as photographers, and and I think we're artists, we need to read this book. It's filled with wonderful stuff about quieting the critic in our brains and overcoming our fears and working through roadblocks. Um, wonderful read. It's a very tiny little book, but it's, it's, um, it's really important. And I'm just showing you a book uh, about Robert Irwin, who was an abstract painter who eventually decided to go outside the canvas with his work and then to give up the canvas completely and create these constructions. And he has spent a whole career out of turning um, museum rooms into something really wonderful and wonky if you're paying attention and you really look. Sometimes he said, I will, people will come in, they'll look for five seconds and leave. It's like, there's nothing here. And other times people will come in and really slow down and really look and they'll see what, what is actually here. His big thing is to forget the name of things. Um, good reads. Um, so I just, I'm reading, I'm studying. I continue looking a moment where a little flash of bright light at the beach catches me and I walk over and I see this. Um, I left my camera at my brother-in-law and sister-in-law's house um, about two months ago. We had driven up for a day and I, so we had to drive halfway to meet so I could get it the next morning. And while I was waiting for them, I noticed this bent up piece of metal in the parking lot with the light and shadows playing on it. And there's more stuff. So it's just not what painters and artists, but um, it's writers, it's literature, it's music, it's poetry. There's so much out there that we can read and study and learn from, and that will come to inform and influence how we see and what we take pictures of. In this particular case, it's poetry. Um, books of poetry. Actually, it's books about how to write poetry, uh, which I'm really fascinated by because it actually gets into the meat and potatoes about how they do it, the work involved, um, the editing, all of that sort of thing. It, it, there are some lessons for us in this. And Ted Couser, who's um, a really fabulous poet, he was a poet laureate of the United States twice. He's a insurance, a retired insurance salesman out in the middle of Nebraska. The last kind of guy you'd think who would write these really wonderful, touching um, poems. Uh, as I was uh, doing a little research on him recently, um, I discovered a or found a, uh, a review article of his latest book of poetry by a guy who writes something in the North American Review, some sort of literature journal. And there were some things he said in there that um, I've actually culled out because they're so important, I think, for just thinking about. He said, Couser's poems train us to pay attention. They do. If you read his poetry, you just know that he shows you little slivers of the everyday world. And he said, even his the briefest moments that he um, presents pre um, can lead us more deeply into our own lives. Absolutely true. That's been my experience. He sees the everyday world um, in striking new ways. And he communicates that to the uh, to the reader using his honed attention to the things around him, and it's that kind of attention that's not only useful, the writer said, but that it changes the world. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Isn't it true? The, the best of your best images, don't they have an effect on people when they look at them? Um, okay, so live as much of your life as you can, read as much as you can, study, practice, practice, practice all the time and try and be awake, body and soul to the magic of the world. And another place you can look for really interesting articles and learn about um, people and their lives and how they do things is in the obituary pages. This is a screenshot from the New York Times. I read the obituary page once or twice a week because there's always something in here worth looking at. It might be something about an artist who I never knew about and then I go exploring. I found the abstract expressionists this way. Some of them passed away in the last four or five years. Um, uh, it could be an actor. It could be, um, you know, a, a sports figure. Something in their lives happens um, and you read about it and you think, huh, you know, that's, there's something there for me. So I keep working on and the really cool stuff just keeps occurring. So then this happened. All right, so I've taken you through a whole series of things. I'm on Amazon, I'm on the computer and I'm on Amazon and I'm typing in keyword searches. Um, the art of seeing, practicing uh, seeing, photography and seeing. And this book in the upper left-hand corner pops up, The Practice of Contemplative Photography, Seeing the World with Fresh Eyes. It's put up by, um, a group called the Mixong Institute, which is Tibetan. It's a Tibetan word for the good eye. And I'm intrigued and I read the back cover and there's a pull quote from Jay Micells, who's a New York photographer who I love. His work really is fabulous. Mark mentioned him at the beginning. If you haven't ever looked at his work, go search for him. There are videos, there's a documentary on, on him on um, Amazon Prime. Anyways, he says, you know, give this book some, uh, give it a chance, really read it. And if you do, if you take it seriously, you will be a different photographer when you're done. And I'm like, okay, you, you sold me. I bought the book and it was, it was fabulous. Um, they, these other three books are things that they've published in the last uh, six or seven years. I took a series of workshops with them. I actually studied, sort of studied with them for three years. Um, they're, they call themselves contemplative photographers. And it's why I identify myself in the same way. They're all about immersing in the moment to moment um, activity of looking so completely that it essentially becomes um, a zo the zone or a flow state, or even you could even say it's a meditative state. Um, and um, I've practiced this and it's really easy for me to slide into that sort of frame of mind when I'm looking. Um, and I know that it's only in that way, um, that is finding my way into that state. Um, the only way I can do that is to slow down. And that when I do that, the, the portal into seeing the world in this kind of way occurs. Um, I'm at a, a friend invites us to come out and walk her property in Troy. And she's got a couple of fish ponds and I'm walking across the berm. I didn't see this, I didn't expect it, but boy, when it aligned, Really, it just sort of, as I came up on it, I could almost feel it all coming together. It was a really uh, intense moment. I'm shooting the leaves in this Japanese maple all week. They're changing the blue sky. And then one morning I come out and they're all on the ground. It's like they all fell on some sort of signal from the universe. And I'm like, oh no. And I walk over and there's the best picture of the week in the bird bath. Janice and I are making a run to Costco. And we see this murmuration of blackbirds flying around, it's dusk. And all of a sudden they alight on the power line right next to us. We zip into the parking lot, jump out and take two pictures and a second later they're flying away. Um, something I see while walking around. Um, I just love the look, the expression on that dog's face. Um, fog on an early morning drive when I was going somewhere. I'm pulling into a parking lot to go see an art exhibit down in Troy. And I notice the stains on the wall that look like a waterfall. Some sort of construction going on at a, um, a commercial building as I'm out walking around the morning. And I, I'm, I, for a moment, I'm disoriented. I can't really figure out what it is, but it turns out there's a little second floor um, alcove up there and they had torn the face off as they were doing some repairs. Um, I'm at the San Francisco airport waiting to catch a flight. 
I love those moments. Yeah, give me a half an hour where I can just roam around and not have to worry about anything. I look up and there's all this stuff going on on the ceiling of well, the light and the shadows and they have this beam running through the terminal and I, I've, I've gone through there twice now and every time I do, I, I say, let's get to the airport a little earlier. <laughs> or when, you know, literally light and shadow um, show themselves to me or just this moment of one red leaf on the sidewalk just keeps happening. I just keep roaming and I'm looking, I'm trying not to uh, anticipate anything, but I am trying to pay as much attention as I can to everything. And all the things that I've learned along the way are coming to play and how this all works itself out. Inga's garbage bags. I actually went over there and grabbed one and brought it home so I could just keep looking at it. Um, some wacky cloud formation that I saw one day when Janice and I were out taking a walk in the afternoon. Um, first time we went to the Florida beach after we got to Alabama, I saw the most glorious sunrise I ever seen. And the next time we went, we got up at dawn and we said, let's go see another sunrise. And it was foggy. And we said, nah, let's just stay in. We'll have some coffee and chill. And then we said, no, let's just go. It'll be foggy. That's okay. We'll just get on and walk the beach. And as we walked onto the beach, this is what I saw. So don't ever let the weather slow you down. Fog, snow, rain, heat, cold, dress up, take your clothes off, whatever it takes, go out. The world is amazing. And no matter what's going on, um, another weather related image, it rains a ton one day, the next day, at overnight, the temperatures drop into the mid 20s, which is unusual for Montgomery. Um, and there's this flash freeze. And we go out for a walk in the morning and it's so bitter cold, we can't stand it. So we take a shortcut to go home. And as I'm walking down the street, I see something to the right, a little flicker of light. And I've learned to trust those moments. And I go over and look, and this is what is there. I can't believe that it froze in this kind of a pattern. And yet there was also water underneath it. We're in uh, Germany visiting the Museum of Modern Art and I peer over the edge up from the third floor and there's this arrangement of people sitting in chairs. Okay, so here's um, the last set of uh, books I'm gonna talk to you about. Um, I decided I was really, a couple years ago, I was really gonna try and apply myself to drawing and painting. I read this book, Drawing from Observation. There's a whole genre, a whole school of Painting and drawing that's based on actual visualizing something that you're looking at. Uh, it was fabulous. Mitchell Albala is a wonderful landscape painter. He talks a lot about graphic design, tonal values, the sorts of things that we need to become familiar with as people who are dealing with light and the visual world. And Joseph Albers wrote this really wonderful book. He taught, he taught at Yale um, in the 50s and 60s, uh, this seminal book on the interaction of colors. He was a big color guy. Um, it was a, um, an important book at the time and many artists use it uh, today. We should read these kinds of books. Um, I took a drawing class. I found a, a painter here in Montgomery who was teaching drawing classes from observation. We had models. This was something I did in charcoal. This is another charcoal piece. These were some pastels that I did. Uh, a couple of chairs in one of the side rooms, um, some fruit on a table. Um, I've, ad I've attempted to do some paintings, a uh, cereal bowl on a countertop in the kitchen or some peaches. You know, just by doing this, okay, I'm never gonna be, you know, rich and famous from painting. Um, I, these aren't even all that good, but in the process of working with this and playing with it, I've come to understand that as much as I thought I was really looking carefully and really looking deeply, there is nothing like spending two hours looking at a bowl of peaches um, that won't train you to see even more detail and more interesting stuff that's going on. The subtle little variations in color and tone, um, it, it's just, um, it's been a really, really, really useful um, process, a really learning, good learning process for me. Um, I just love the way how you're dealing with a two-dimensional two um, surface and because of the way you create, uh, you use the paint and create shadows, uh, you can create this real three-dimensional feel. Well, isn't that what we do? I mean, we have two-dimensional flat surfaces and yet if we're thinking about the arrangement of the graphic elements and the way the light is playing and whatnot, you can create some really stunning images uh, by using those elements. Okay. 
two last things. Firstly, um, last June, right in the middle of the pandemic, um, I joined the Atlanta Photography Group in Atlanta, and they're really big on um, creating portfolios and projects. Uh, and as I've shown you, there's nothing that I've shown you that really sort of fits the bill on that question. Um, but I was intrigued by it. But I was also um, kind of turned off by the whole conceptualization that a lot of them talk about. You know, they conceive of an idea and then they try and create the images from that. And it just, I know that that works and some of the greatest photographic work um, in the world are, is created in that way, but it just doesn't fit what I'm doing and where I get my greatest joy from. And so I wasn't sure there was anything there for me, um, but I wanted to, um, give it a shot. I submitted a portfolio as part of the portfolio reviews they do. Um, it got panned completely, but it was a really useful learning experience. You know, they talked about what makes something work. And then a friend from Seattle, who's a part of a photography cooperative out there last June said, we're going to do a fundraiser. Everybody chips in 25 bucks. You go out for two days on a weekend, take some photos, send us your five best ones, the one that you like most. We'll pick one. We'll include it in a virtual re, um, show, we'll do a reception, and then we'll auction off all the images, all of it to raise money. I thought, okay, 25 bucks. I like this person. I'll help them out. So I, I join the weekend. I go out and I'm roaming in my neighborhood on that weekend. And I find a patch of canna lilies. Um, they're very tall, leafy flowers with a little teeny flower at the top, but it's almost all, all leaf. And they stand about six feet, this, this particular patch. Um, I walked by this spot for, I've been in this neighborhood for eight years. I never saw it. Well, I did on this weekend and I went over and I took this image plus a bunch of others. And this is the one that got in the show. And I was like, wow, this is a really wonderful spot. And I went back a couple more times and I kept, and when I did, I didn't go back and say, I want to take another picture like this, or I want something that's like that or the other thing. I just said, all right, let's see what happens. I'm going to go back to the same spot again and again and again. And I'm just going to take pictures based on what hops out at me, what reveals itself to me. And so this body of work comes out of that. Um, none of this is preconceived. I wasn't looking for this. I just went over there. The conditions were different. Some days it was cloudy. Some days it was rainy and wet. Other days the sun was shining and it was bright. And I showed it to a friend who, a photography buddy of mine out on the West Coast. And he said, you know, Warren, these are pretty good. I think you should show them to um, Bruce Jensen, the guy from Lenswork. He does a portfolio review for 50 bucks. So I, I, I sent them to um Jensen and it took him a couple months but he sent me back a 20 minute video and he literally went through every one of the images and he talked about projects he said subject based projects like this are the easiest to do because you know you pick a subject he said and most of the time they fail because they're repetitive he said in this case I really like your project because um it's not repetitive. Every image is new. It's different and forms you in a different way. And I was glad that he liked the project. That's, it's always nice when someone likes your work. But for me, it was all those little nuggets of um, ideas and, and wisdom that he had for what makes a project work and most importantly, what makes it fail. And I realized for the first time that I might actually be able to work in this way. That is, I can work as a contemplative photographer, just go and see what's there, but I can visit the same place over and over and over again, just like a kid seeing everything new for the first time. So I was quite happy with how all this worked out. And then the last thing, um, this was the thing I mentioned to Mark at the beginning of this talk. I've been roaming through parking garages. Um, in December, when J Jupiter and Saturn aligned, I, we went down to the one of the public garages in Montgomery and we went up to the top floor so we could see the sky better. And there were a bunch of tire marks on the floor. Someone had been up there peeling rubber. And I thought, oh, I got to come back and take a look at this. It's really fabulous. And when I did, it was, um, you know, a lot of wonderful abstract, you know, burned rubber into the concrete. But I also saw some really interesting cracks and stains and texture, both on the floor, on the walls, and in the ceilings and in the beams. And so I, this is a, a before picture of one of those things that I saw. And when I got home, I painted on it in the digital darkroom. Um, 
in a way, you know, when you apply a color in Photoshop, you can do it at 100% and it just obliterates it, all the texture and everything that's behind it. What you start looking at is the color, not what is actually there. In this case, I'm using that color tool at about 10% or 12% or 3% opacity. And I'm using the things that I've learned from the painters, A, through painting myself, for thinking about color, thinking about tonal values, everything that I've learned through this whole process that goes back to 2003 and before to create this work. This is the before and this is the after. I call them my concrete landscapes. This is a beam in the ceiling. I crop it a little bit. I play with the colors um, um, and something like this happens. Um, I loved the texture here. And then when I painted it on the digital darkroom, it became a, a landscape. Um, this is something that is sort of a starry night, a version of starry night. It was just a lichen on a wall that was um, really uh, interesting. Um, another um, interesting crack and when I got home and painted on it, um, I, this photo messes with my head every time I look at it because I see a ridge line. And then I see water coming in at the shore and I can't, my eye can't settle on what it is. Is it a ridge line with mountains and the sky or is it the shoreline with water coming in? Um, I love that. I love when something like that happens. Just more of the same thing where, um, and I'm just having a blast and I'm exploring and I'm finding that everything that I've learned beforehand is informing what I'm doing here now. And um, it's just, it's fun. It's deeply satisfying. It really, it's uh, soul quenching. Um, and I think I'm just glad to be alive and, you know, have my fingers and toes and my eyes um, and interacting with the world um, in this way. Um, and I think back to where I was at the beginning when I was, I didn't think I could possibly, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't concept, even conceive that this is where this would take me. And yet here I am. And I'm sitting here talking to you and I'm like, well, I can't believe it. So I'll stop here. Um, this is uh, Bart, Bill, and Freddie, and they say, don't let anybody ever tell you that curiosity can kill you, because it doesn't. It leads you to really wonderful places. Um, and that's it. Well, Art, that was phenomenal. I, I, I got even more out of it the second time around. I, I really uh, enjoyed it and uh, picked up more details. I want to thank you for uh, sharing, uh, taking us on a little trip through your mind and your way of thinking and sometimes not thinking about uh, what's going on around you. Um, we did have a question early on. Uh, was it, what, the question was, do you spend time looking through the viewfinder for composition or as some street photographers do, they just wait and only bring the camera up at the last second? Um, for me, the, uh, the question of framing is really important. Usually what happens is that something in the visual world really stops me cold. I call it my uh, full stop moment. So for instance, I, I see, I saw that boat floating in the water and I was walking along a stone um, breakwater uh, when I came upon it. And as I came up on it, I started to discern what the framing was gonna be. Um, I wasn't looking through the viewfinder. In fact, I consciously avoid, I, don't do that. I don't go for my camera immediately and go. I stop. I try and look and pay attention. Okay, what stopped me here? And based on what stopped me, how can I express that with my camera? And I try and figure it out. And then I use the camera to create the framing that I think is what gets at the essence of what it was that stopped me. And then I try and take as few pictures of it as possible. It's kind of, and I crop in camera. I never crop on the computer. Everything you just saw was as I took it. Um, Cause it's, um, it, for me, it's a rigorous training to train my eye in a very disciplined way to slow down, discern what stopped me, figure out the cropping and the framing. It's something Jay Micells talks about um, and I love. And based on that, take the picture. And if I go home and I have to crop it, unless it's this landscape stuff, which I'm doing, which is a little bit different, it's working in an unusual way, but everything prior to that, um, if I had to crop it, I just left it be, I, I didn't fiddle with it because I was kind of tight on that question. I'm a little less tight on it now. Um, I have another question about uh, the painting of the stains in Photoshop. 
and a little bit more clarity on your technique. Well, are you putting on, are you using a brush at low opacity or are you using a color fill layer at low opacity? How does that work? Um, I, I look at what it is that I'm looking at. Sometimes I'll work on something and the colors just don't work together because they're you know, you start thinking about complementary colors and analogous colors or colors that um, are starkly different from each other and create this uh, wild, wonderful uh, vibration. Um, and then I'm looking uh, in the color palette and I'm selecting a color. Sometimes I, I'm a, a desktop publisher in my day job. Um, so I have some ideas about how to use that color palette and some of the different Pantone color books and other things that are out there where you know what the equations are for getting a specific color. But oftentimes I'm just fiddling. Okay, that kind of looks like maybe I should start with trying to make that a sky. So let's find the blue and I sample the blue and I just load that into the brush and I set the opacity for 12% or 14% or 2% and I start playing and experimenting. And in the course of that, I find my way, um, but it's, it's almost never planned. Um, it's just playful exploring and that's what comes out of it that's great and of course it's informed by everything else that that has proceeded you know when you hit the shutter button everything that has happened in your life from the day you were born to the moment you hit that shutter button is coming to play and taking that picture in one way or another mm -hmm. um you know if not necessarily you know everything all at once but it could be all kinds of things that we're just not aware of that affects who we are as conscious beings um and because we're all unique what we see and how we see it and then how we express it is going to be unique from each of us from one person to the next well your results uh are spectacular uh and they really are you know thought provoking uh, so that's, that's fantastic. Are there any other questions out there? Group is kind of quiet tonight, although I'm getting a lot of compliments here about the, the talk. Uh, and everybody really loves the subject and, and your pictures that you showed. Anybody else? Questions for Warren? Well, Warren, I, I just can't thank you enough. It's been a, a real pleasure and um, I know. Well, that, thank you for having me. I know that. This, you know, it's. Um, I'm sorry, Bart. Go ahead. No, I just to say I know this is going to affect uh, a lot of us and how we we uh, look at our craft uh, going forward. You're going to be one of those influences that helps change what we do. Well, you know, it's um, it's a two way street. Whenever you uh, you participate in something like this and you prepare a presentation, you sort of have to go back and look at all your work and think it through. The presentation I gave here tonight was a little different than the one I gave at Linda's because in the course of working this presentation up, um, I realized there were some things I needed to um, adjust my thinking on a little bit because I've had some experiences since then. Um, and then sometimes you get into discussions with people. It's like what happens when I participate in the Atlanta Photography Group. There is a real exchange of thoughts and ideas. And sometimes it's just looking at people's work and listening to what they have to say. So um, I really appreciate you asking me and I'm really tickled if it um, it resonates with you in some way and that's great. Um, and um, that's how we all, um, you know, explore and have some fun. Wonderful, let's see. Uh, let me just check again for any more questions. Oh, uh, there's a question. Do you have a website where we can look at your other work? And yes, he does. Yep. I'm on Instagram, Warren Simons Photos. And I'm also at www.warrensimonsphotos.com. That's my website. Okay. And. Uh, the question is your work exhibited anywhere? Well, because that's the same thing as a website. I know Warren has uh, exhibited on a lot of places. He's uh, you know, also uh, won a number of awards uh, in various uh, competitions and expositions. So, uh, yeah, there's, you know, um, such an interesting question. Uh, don't we all love to get into shows if it's juried? Yeah, I 
got into that show. And then you don't, and you're like, I didn't get into that show. I can't believe it. And then you look at the work that get in. It's like, are you kidding me? That judge picked that and did pick mine. So it's, it's so, Oh Lordy, it's complicated. (laughs) You know, sometimes you're just like, okay, I give up. I don't want to, I don't want to do that anymore because it tears me apart. And then you just have to think, okay, whatever, you know, people, everybody views things in their own way and judges choose things. So yeah, I, I've gotten into some exhibits and I've won some awards. Um, it's always wonderful to win a cash award because it helps pay for the framing. Um, and I've had, there's a gallery here in Montgomery. I've had a couple of um, shows that I've uh, shared with another artist, uh, shared the gallery space. And I did a one person show down at the Troy uh, Johnson Center down in Troy, Alabama, where I hung 50 images. And that was something, Ooh. just something to pull off. Yeah. Um, and done other things like that. And I'm still sort of wondering, you know, what's the next step? Um, I'm involved in this photography show here and that's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work and I don't know if I want to do that again. Um, so I don't know. We'll just have to see what the future holds. But exhibiting and going through that process, especially if you're going to hang 12 or 15 images, it makes you think about what you're going to hang, how you're going to hang it, where you're going to hang it in the gallery. You have to go in and look at the space and you have to, and there's all kinds of things that come to play. And that's a very good experience. So if you ever get a chance to do that, do it. Even if it hurts, (laughs) you'll learn some things. Okay. Um, Linda was wondering if you would talk now, you weren't just talking about the photo contest that you're part of. Well, you'd mentioned it to me that you're helping put together a big photo show. Maybe you tell, tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, about three years ago, a friend of mine and I sat down and started having coffee and talking about um, photography. And then we invited a couple more people and a couple more after that. And soon we had nine. And one of them was the director of the Stonehenge Gallery here. And a show fell through and um, right at the last minute. He said, well, let's have a photography show. We'll call it the nine okay, we're all game. We did. We didn't think anything was going to come of it. Well, we sold some work and it created a little buzz. And we said, wow, let's, let's do this again. But this time let's make it a, you know, um, a public invitation jury show. And we did. And the first year we had 77 photographers submit 210 pieces. And then this year we had, um, no, last year we had 123 people submit 400 pieces. And this year we had 228 submit 671 pieces. Um, And we got the curator of photography at the High Museum. And wow, it's turned into a really big, amazing thing. And so I'm not sure where we're going to go with that. Um, I love working on something that helps promote the idea that photography can be a fine art. Um, But there's lots of challenges involved in doing that kind of work. Um, we don't have paid staff. It's all volunteer. I've spent literally hundreds of hours working on this, so we'll see. Um, but it's been some, been some fun working on it. Yeah, it certainly fills your day. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I have to retire. I'm retiring at the end of this month just so I can have time to do stuff like that. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, let's see. All right, I think uh, I've gotten through all the questions here. If I uh, didn't, start waving at me, but uh, otherwise, uh, well, Dennis, did you have something to ask? No, he was just scratching his ear. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Don't move, otherwise I'll call on you. Does, does Dennis have some update on the church, Dennis? You need to unmute yourself, Dennis. Yeah. Can't hear you. Exactly. Yes. The the latest is that they're going to have the first indoor uh, service on on July the 4th. And uh, they pull the pews out. And they're going to go with folding chairs and they're going to limit the capacity to 50 people. And uh, it looks like we might have a shot for our August or September meeting. Okay. 
but I will tell you more when I know it. Okay, well, that's encouraging. Thank you. All right. You bet. Um, any other comments, announcements? Uh, anything anybody wants to say before we let Warren go? Just uh, once again, Warren. Well, thank this, you very much for very everybody. Grateful. You know, this is just a real treat. Well, thank you. Appreciate Warren, it. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Yes, thanks. All right, folks. It's a great one. And uh, two weeks from now, we'll have our next competition. So we'll see you all then. Thank you again. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye, thank all. you. Bye.